we are going to start the first symposium for the day. We have three eminent uh, personalities to discuss the stimulants, addiction, and behavior change in nutrition. Uh, they are the Dr. Harshani Rajapaksa and Professor Arjuna De Silva and Dr. Laknath Velagedar. And uh, our the, the plenary lecture is done by Dr. Harshani Rajapaksa. She is from uh, Faculty of Medicine, University of Ruhuna. Uh, Dr. Harshani is going to talk about the the power of tiny habits, behavior change in health and nutrition. Uh, Dr. Harshani is graduated from University of Sri Jayavardhanapura with an MBBS, and she completed MD in Psychiatry as Postgraduate Institute of Medicine, University of Galambu, and she completed her FRCS in London, and uh, she completed her PhD in University Durham. And Dr. Harshani is a senior lecturer in psychiatry in Faculty of Medicine. She's a honorary consultant psychiatrist at the teaching hospital, Harapiti. She's a person with many more talents and treating patients. And uh, over to you, uh, Dr. Harshani. She, her topic is the power of tiny habits, behavior change in health and nutrition. Good morning, everybody. Hope you all are well and safe during this difficult period. First of all, I would like to thank uh, Professor C.M. Vikramathilaka, uh, the President of the Nutrition Society of Sri Lanka and the Council for inviting me to share my thoughts with you all. So let's get to the today's topic. Uh, today we are going to discuss about the power of tiny habits. This is about behavioral change in health and nutrition. So a lot of problems related to health and related to nutrition, they have occurred due to certain change, changes of uh, our changing behaviors in our patients and ourselves as well. So the same way uh, can be use these uh, changes to a better, towards a better nutrition and a, towards a better health. This is what we are going to discuss today. So when we talk about changing behaviors, uh, we can't forget this spiral model, which was described by Prochaska and Deppermitt. So in this model, we go through certain stages. We call the first stage pre-contemplation, where we are not ready for a change. And then we think about it. And with those uh, influences and inputs, and we prepare. And then we take action. And then while we are doing certain things for a change, sometimes we go back to our old habit. But then we join or the rejoin this spiral, uh, I mean, much higher level than what we were. And ultimate goal is to go towards the maintenance. So this model is very useful when we talk about behavioral changes in food and health. So here there are two important points because as doctors, we all know uh, you know, how to advise patients regarding uh, good nutrition and good healthy habits. But sometimes, once they are, you know, in a preparing uh, stage or in action stage, uh, to plan especially, to initiate, we need a little bit of push or share our thoughts with the patients to start a particular behavior. And also to prevent relapses, we have to help them how to get back to this model and achieve our goal. So let's look at the behavioral changes mainly. But remember, there's a big component of cognitive aspect to this model. 
but today i'm not going to elaborate on that cognitive aspect but here we are mainly focusing on the behavioral changes and how they are uh, effective for this uh, desired change uh, since uh, we are a generation we had a lot of stories so storytelling is a nice way to understand something so i have taken this example of mr a who used to come home very tired and he keep his bag aside and sleeps in his chair and he gets up with a backache and a neck pain also he is hungry and goes to the kitchen and eats a salty oily snack while browsing his facebook page then he feels good but he has hypertension and his doctor has advised him not to take food with added salt or oily food and he he was told to exercise regularly then when he tries when he tries to take big commands like you know don't do this don't do that stop this he becomes mentally and physically exhausted because his desires and his advisers they don't go together then he feel like you know what's the point of living if i can't do what i want i think this story we have you know it's not very uh, un unfamiliar to us this is very familiar to all of us so because of this we have to learn how something a behavior uh, change us and make make that particular behavior a habit in us so the first thing is there are certain cues usually very attractive something we like pleasurable thing right and with that we get a craving we want that right and with that craving we have a response a positive response and once you do it and that gives you some kind of mental and physical reward and with that we go and search search for the uh, whatever that behavior again and again for example uh, if it is uh, sugar or oily food they are very uh, you know when we eat sugar and it gives us a nice feeling so next time we look for it we look for uh, the des dessert corner right so like that certain behaviors they go into habits habit formation so this is the foundation of habit formation so why can't we use the same same principle to get out from these certain habits so this is what i am going to talk today so the very step the very first step we are going to talk today is uh you know motivating uh, our patients for better behaviors or better habits so we have to tell them that this change is not that difficult not difficult as you think because change always gives uh, some uneasy feeling we don't like changes we want to do the way we did in the past it's it's similar for any behavior so this change is not that difficult as you think it's easy so how how can you explain this you have to say you have to do only five things it's simple like your five fingers first you have to set values what do you want in life how do you want to live they will say i want to be healthy i want to be a, a person without major illnesses and lot of things so first you have to set values this is what i want reduce weight or whatever the values you want and then you have to focus on the direction the path this is the path which i am going to walk and then take one small step towards your direction of your chosen values and then what you have to do is to focus on the progress daily a tiny tiny steps which will take us to our 
uh, end point like the tortoise here. So this is the message we have to give them, not drastic change. So it's easy to make up our mind. Okay, I will do one thing, one day, five minutes of exercise, something like that. Okay. So the starting point you have to encourage, you have to uh, tell them that this is not difficult. Then once you are there, what you have to do is you have to have a plan, right? Plan for the change, preparation and action. So here, this is, there are a lot of things we can do, but the easy thing is to pair your bad behavior or the old behavior or the old habit with a new habit. So if we take the example of Mr. A, as soon as I come home, change my clothes, and then I will take a bath, or I will have a cup of green tea, or I will walk my pet, something new. This paired behavior or the new behavior should be something we are a little familiar. Uh, alien thing is challenging. We don't like it. So something we used to do even in our childhood or somewhere. And then we have to mentally also prepare a little bit. When I come home, I'm going to change my clothes and then I'm going to do this particular behavior. I will take a bath or something like that. That will refresh. That will give a good feeling, right? And we need to rehearse it and it is very simple. Okay? And that's how you prepare, plan, and go through the action. So when you are doing this, our, when our patients are doing this, even us, when we are doing this, so there are certain uh, instances where we get such an urge, right? So now we have uh, done well uh, uh, for a certain period, but there's a nice... Um, uh, very nicely arranged uh, oily food in a party so how can we how, how can't we how can we ignore this beautiful delicious uh, dish so this is where we need urge surfing because the brain is uh, used to giving in to these bad habits but if we can wait for about 5 to 20 minutes it will go. The craving will go off. For this, for the very first time, it will be difficult and it will be pretty intense. But if you do it again and again, then ultimately you can say no to those cravings very easily. For this, I have a few suggestions. So when you have a craving, you can do a few things. One is, you can distract yourself. But for this, you have to have a little bit of preparation. What kind of distractions uh, you can find in such a situation? Imagine if we are in a party, right? So if we can uh, dance a little bit to the music, that's a distraction and it's a good distraction. So later on, we can come to the uh, uh, Put the tables or the dinner area or the, the where the food is right. Otherwise, we have the habit of rushing towards the food, uh, thinking as if you know uh, there won't be anything left when I come. Kind of a idea. So because of this, we have to have some kind of distraction which can uh, which we can do at that particular time. Uh, and also the second Ds, there are four Ds. The first one is distracting. Second one is distancing. You can stay further away from the uh, alcohol bar, right, in a party. Or even at home, uh, if you are keeping certain things for children or for a visitor, keep it under lock and key. Don't keep it in your vicinity because we all are human beings. When we see these things, we tend to take it out and eat easily accessible things. So distance. And ultimately, draw, don't bring uh, them at all, right? But that is the last thing. We can't do it at the beginning. And the third one is displacing, right? Displacing it with something else, right? 
So for uh, oily food, we can have something else, a healthy salad. So you can start with salads and then you will eat less from the carbohydrates and fats and things like that. So uh, you are the people who knows best about what should be uh, used as substitute not me but the principle is displacing and the last one the last d is discussing you can discuss about this when you get this urge uh, you can call someone or you can talk to someone and a friend or family and you achieve two things one is you have talked to someone uh, who you want to talk to and it's a nice experience and they will be also happy otherwise we usually call people only for help no so for something other something other than a help it's nice to talk to someone right and even you can discuss about uh, you know your plans and achievements and okay so whatever you do uh, you have to do something which is uh, uh, not very distressing you not very distressing to yourself right so these are not distressing these behaviors are not distressing distracting distancing displacing and discussing four days not difficult to remember and also we have to remember when we do these things uh, we can add more to this recipe like mindfulness and uh, relaxation and a lot of other things right and also we have to practice these things in moderation. Even good thing, I mean, uh, mangoes or fruits are good to eat, but if you are going to eat 10, 15 mangoes, uh, that's not good, right? Whatever it is, you have to do it in moderation. And always reward yourself when you achieve something, uh, buy something you like, or you know, go for a vacation, or reward yourself, buy a new book for you, something like that, to reward yourself. So this is how we uh, easily serve our urges. So we know how, we, how to start, how to maintain, and how to serve the urge. And uh, the take-home message for the day is changes are not difficult. What you have to do is to identify what you need to change, the desired behavior. And then... We have to select one and take one tiny step towards the desired, uh, desired uh, value, right? And focus on the progression. And please, this is very important. No one is perfect. And don't think of achieving the perfect level, right? What is necessary is the progression. And we can apply more once we achieve something. And this is an art. When you learn this art, you can apply to many other things. So this is why uh, I'm trying to uh, share my thought of tiny steps, the power of tiny steps. Even they look very tiny. This will be very helpful to walk a long journey safely and without uh, being you know, distressed about these things without feeling guilty. So with this, we can always enjoy the life and we are always progressing towards a better life with good nutrition and good health. Thank you very much. Uh, thank you, Dr. Harshani. And actually, she explained the power of tiny habits, how it changes our behavior uh, in health and nutrition. We can easily use it uh, to change our dietary patterns and the other thing. And in this symposium, two of our the lecturers are actually they are joining online. And Professor Arjunadi Silla is here with us. And after the, the main lectures, you can join for the panel discussion via the, our chat box uh, in Zoom. Secondly, it's an honor and a pleasure to invite Professor Arjuna de Silva, a very senior 
professor in medicine and he's the chairman for the sri lanka anti doping agency and he's going to talk about the dietary supplements stimulants and the doping professor arjun de silva graduated from colombo north medical faculty and he had many academic qualifications md from postgraduate institute of medicine colombo msc frcp fccp and he is a consultant physician was appointed uh, professor in medicine and he is now senior professor in medicine in uh, faculty of medicine university of kelani and i cordially invite professor arjun de silva to talk about the dietary supplements stimulants and do uh, thank you for that very kind uh, introduction of damika and first time of thank uh, professor uh, chandima and the nutrition society of uh, sri lanka for giving me this opportunity uh, she must have had a lot of sleepless nights communicating with me because uh, i was in the middle of uh, uh, bio bubble with england and so many issues we had to deal with all right so this is a topic very close to my heart so uh thank you for giving this opportunity i think we should collaborate well uh while they are preparing the uh, presentation uh, there's a message uh, for the listeners uh, you can uh, send your question through the chat and uh, meantime uh, we are going to have a quiz and the details uh, uh, will be delivered uh, before the final lecture and if you have any questions please send through the chat right sorry for the delay it's uh, first time i have given the presentation early and it doesn't happen so the topic is dietary supplements stimulants and doping if you talk about the history of doping even in 700 bc uh, ancient greek games athletes were encouraged to consume sheep testicles things have not changed that much from that time so 1904 marathon runner thomas hicks received two injections containing strychnine which you know is a poison no and some brandy and he actually won the race in 1928 the iwf becomes the first sporting body to ban the use of doping agents for enhanced performance uh but they didn't have any power at that time so it was just on goodwill in 1954 a physician on the us weightlifting team learned that the soviet union has been using testosterone to boost uh, performance so they started doing the same in 1960 danish cyclist kurt uh, edmark jensen died in the rome olympic games after taking amphetamine in 1960 Uh, 64 anabolic steroids became common place in the olympic games uh, including and it became uh, rampant in bodybuilding in 1966 drug testing begins for the first time in european athletic championships then in 1976 uh, the first test this is a big uh, advancement uh, to detect anabolic steroids was developed enabling government bodies to ban these substances in future olympic games again another landmark event 1988 uh, ben johnson shocked the world uh, after winning the 100 meters olympic he was stripped from the gold medal in 1999 as a result of that wada world anti doping agency was established in 19 in 2009 the athlete biological passport program is launched and uh, even sri lanka we have that in 2012 uh, again another landmark lance armstrong who was one time the main sponsor of the usada american doping anti doping agency uh, was found to have systematically doped he didn't never failed the doping test this was on sub Uh, other evidence because he had never tested positive uh, then in 2013 a 
Slada, Sri Lankan Anti-Doping Agency was established by an act of parliament. Uh, in 2015, the Russian doping scandal was uh, came to light. And in 2020, with COVID, we, we have to stop testing. Uh, though we have restarted it, testing has become limited. What about the prohibited list in 2020? Well, this is important for all people to know, just not in detail, but just the outline. Uh, so there are substances banned at all times. That means you can't take, if you are an athlete, you can't take this at all. So uh, non-approved substances, category is not anabolic steroids, peptide hormones, growth factors, mimetics, beta-2 agonists, uh, and hormones and metabolic modulators, diuretic and masking agents, important to remember, because some of... Uh, Fusimide drugs like that may be antihypertensives. So uh, they are actually banned at all times. Uh, prohibited methods, uh, manipulation of blood and blood products, important. Uh, it's banned at all times. Chemical and physical manipulation, gene and cell doping. Uh, remember, if there is a no needle policy, in most uh, athletic and sports events, you can't have needles in the village, Olympic village. Uh, that's because if you are giving anything more than 100 cc of IV, you have the athlete should be in hospital. So Olympic Games, they follow no needle policy. Uh, Prohibited substance in competition. So these you can use out of competition, but in competition you can't use. So stimulants, narcotics, cannabinoids, and glucocorticoids. But remember, the line between in competition and out, competition, out of competition is somewhat gray. So even if you take it out of competition and you are tested in competition and found positive, there may be an issue. Uh, then there is a category of they are prohibited in particular sports like beta blockers in archery, shooting, things like that to stop the tremor. So now we come on to the main thing where I think we should cooperate a lot. So supplements, a huge issue for us. A dietary supplement is a manufactured product. There are so many definitions. I use this. Intended to supplements one diet by taking a pill, capsule, tablet, powder, liquid. It is a $37 billion industry in the U.S., right? 50% uh, of the U.S. population are taking supplements. In Sri Lanka, I'll show the values we have. Um, more than 90%, Dr. Lal is here, he'll confirm that. 90% of the athletes are taking supplements. I'm not referring to banned sub supplements, supplements in general. So the supplements could be vitamins, minerals, essential fatty acids, proteins, bodybuilding supplements, which are generally banned, natural products, and probiotics. So do you need the supplements? Uh, well, if you are doing profit, my, I mean, we, are, we can argue the whole day about this, but uh, to make it simple, if you are a professional bodybuilder, yes, you need supplements, right? If you look, this is Ronnie Coleman. Uh, who was Mr. Olympia, I think, five times, right? One of the biggest, uh, is over 230 pounds with a body fat content of how much? 4%. Less than 4%, right? To get that, to go 230 pounds and have a body fat content of less than 4%, it's almost impossible. You can see the muscle fiber. So obviously you need to take supplements. And also this is another important thing to notice practically. If you look at the stomach, that's known as the steroid. You can see the rectus has separated. That is another obvious sign of steroid use. It's called the bubble gut. So whey protein, yes. Uh, you all know that, well, it's an excellent source of protein. It's easily absorbed. And one scoop can have up to 30 grams of protein. It does contain lactulose. 
and it can cause allergies. Creatine, again used by athletes without any knowledge of the thing. Uh, if you are using it, you should, again, these are not banned. If you are using it, uh, you have to cycle it properly. So there is, uh, there is all these are there's evidence that it improves, but it's not a huge evidence, but there is evidence. Loading dose of 20 grams per day divided for seven days, then maintain at three to five grams per day, and then wash out over four weeks. Now, the guys in the gym know this, right? But some of our poor athletes don't know this, and they just take uh, randomly uh, creatinine. This is the other killer, methylhexamine, known by various names. It's a stimulant. In these are all, this is banned. DM, dimethyl amylalanine. It's a stimulant and sympathomimetic. It has caused many deaths. Right? It's banned by the US military, but it's freely available in Sri Lanka. You can go to step out here and go to any pharmacy or sports shop and buy this. Right? So these are the supplements to avoid. If you get names like Code Red, Jack 3D, Right. I'm sure some, at least one person in the audience knows this and uses this. Don't know anything. Right. Uh, yeah, juice, napalm, words like that. Right. It's in, very interesting that when uh, athletes come to me and I ask them, may I supplement Nankiwama, Dinaboil, Kelakiwama, Apo, Ivanangane. It must say, you ask them, right? Now, if I ask you what dynamo is, most of you all won't know. Right? So, but they know that and they uh, deny usage. So, anabolic supplements contain anabolic steroids or their derivatives. They are used extensively by bodybuilders. We have one doctor who is uh, who is uh, came second in Mr. Sri, Mr. Sri Lanka. Uh, he uses supplements, but he doesn't use banned supplements. He's probably the only one who does. Uh, so again, freely available, many side effects. There are other substances that can improve performance, which are not banned, right? For instance, caffeine. Uh, you can use three to six grams per kg of body weight, uh, and it does improve performance. But if you are sensitive to caffeine, you can't use it, you can get arrhythmias, right? Dietary nitrate is also known to have performance enhancing benefit. And uh, beta alanine, daily consumption of 65 milligrams per kg. Others that improve performance, sodium bicarbonate, again, single acute dose. So these are not bad, but they are known to increase performance and obviously they are used. So this is a long flow chart, but this is what is given to say that before using a supplement, what are the things you have to check? Right? So, I mean, as I said, to cut this short, like if you are not a pro professional bodybuilder, you don't need supplements. Uh, but yes, if you are doing professional bodybuilding, you need supplements. Like you can't achieve that picture of Ronnie Coleman without supplements, right? including banned supplements. So, we have a research unit in uh, SLADA, uh, and uh, we have studied the dietary supplement usage of athletes in a South Asian or regional country. Just to be very brief for the sake of time, the sample size is about 386. Uh, so, uh, again, 90% of them use supplements, mainly uh, multivitamins, protein, creatinine, 19%, uh, 
most of them didn't use it properly. Rehydration fluids, uh, weight gain. Uh, so badminton, shooting, wrestling, netball, and rugby showed a significant higher use of uh, uh, supplements. And the 21 to 35 ages are the most uh, vulnerable. And there was no difference observed in the supplement usage pattern respect to marital status, gender occupation of the athlete or the highest level of participation. So while dietary supplements are used among athletes, uh, their dietary practice definitely means a change. Then usage patterns, knowledge, attitudes. So what were the knowledge and attitudes of the athlete? Again, to summarize that, uh, most of them used it to increase their performance, they thought, and give them energy. 60.5% uh, of the athletes decided themselves what supplement to use. And uh, as I said before, they, they thought it's essential to maintain fitness and to win awards. Both part, uh, perceptions are significantly higher among males than females. What about the health effects of these supplements? So we did a pilot study on 45 healthy athletes to see what happened. And uh, we did the lipid, kidney, liver profile, full blood counts, fasting blood glucose, testosterone, urine, and creatinine. Also, there was a food frequency questionnaire from the athletes. And this is interesting. The total cholesterol and LDL cholesterol may went up significant. Uh, so there was a 8.7% increase. Uh, and LDL was uh, increased by 2.9%. So... This was more in the female athletes. So the clinical significance of this, we'll have to find out why. But definitely, uh, there is an increase in cholesterol in using supplements. So mainly protein supplements. So in conclusion, in that study, we found that there is a negative effect on lipid profile, more pronounced in female, and the clinical implication needs further study. So to summarize, Supplements should only be used in spe specific instances by qualified persons. Uh, supplements, again, are frequently contaminated with toxins and other substances. So because they are made in the same factory, there are so many instances where supplements are contaminated by other drugs. Supplements are not regulated, so they can have anything in them. So you are taking supplements at your own risk. Supplements can have banned substances and they should be avoided by professional athletes. And children, we should have a blanket ban in avoiding supplements. If you take two of the top schools, I can name the school without any problem, Royal and Trinity, uh, they spend their budget for rugby is uh, 20 million a year, 20 million rupees. It is not provided by the school, it's provided by the old boys. Uh, and uh, about half that budget is spent on supplements. It's not banned supplements, but supplements. So uh, just to give you an idea what the amount of money involved is. So I think children under 18 definitely all should avoid uh, supplements and we should, I think the society should combine together and give that message strongly to the schools that supplements should not be a part of them. So, dope-free sport in all three languages, using all the people, all the common sports and all uh, diverse culture uh, involved. There are Muslims, Tamils, uh, Burgers. We are all one country, one nation. Thank you. Few more questions also coming for the Professor Arjun De Silla. And uh, the one question I would like to ask now, uh, because we have a time, and uh, the others will go during the discussion period. 
and one thing uh, the main question is asking how do you sil- uh, find a supplement without a uh, banned substances what are the ways uh, the athlete can practice and what are the ways the doctors who are in the field can use yes uh, first of all again to clarify i think that's a very important question so that's a like saying itself so first thing number one needs to uh, to go back to that chart yes no you can see it here you know so first of first question is uh, do you really need this supplement so to do that you must have a proper nutritional analysis done by a qualified person not a gym instructor uh dr lal knows that when we are sports ministry we do work into regularized gyms we know what happens in gyms uh, so anyone with a good body can become a gym instructor in sri lanka uh, so when you become a gym instructor you uh, teach everyone everything uh, including nutrition without any knowledge at all so that should stop anyway so you analyze and see by do you actually have a deficiency then if you have a deficiency is there no way to naturally go for that so we know that an egg has about 6 grams of protein for good quality ideal quality protein so can you um, chicken are you a vegetarian are you vegan so many things you will have to check and see whether you actually need can get that protein naturally if you can't get that naturally then you can consider uh, a supplement right uh, then which supplement to take ideally if you are a professional athlete batch test that you take a batch and you test that for the presence of banned substance then you can take that then there is a site called informsport.com uh, where you can check whether the supplement is banned or not uh, all these are safeguards with all these till you can test positive right? and if you test positive the problem is with you right so you have to uh, you have to explain and justify that you will be banned definitely but depending on your intention it may be less right for steroids the ban is 4 years if you are a professional athlete that's the end of your career right so even for uh, using diuretics you can get 4 years so i the to summarize what you have to do is go to a professional not to your gym instructor go to a professional clinical nutrition analyze your diet see if there are deficiencies see whether you can go natural for that and if you can't go natural then under medical supervision you have to take a supplement that particular supplement ideal thing should be batch tested uh, for banned substances and then you can proceed thank you sir yeah. we have few more questions uh, we will discuss during the panel discussion thank you sir and the final uh, symposium lecture uh, is a role of public sector in the prevention of addiction this is a very important topic nowadays and we all are aware about the uh, addiction to the various kind of stimulants heroin and other things sri lanka is highly prevalent today and we have a very eminent uh, personality to discuss this topic he is dr Lak- laknath velagedara and uh, he is the actually the chairman for uh, national dangerous drugs controlling board and uh, dr velagedara is uh, actually joining with online platform and dr velagedara is a consultant physician at the kalambu south teaching hospital and uh, as i explain is the chairman for the national dangerous drug control board and he's graduated from uh, peradeni university in mbbs and md from pgm kalambu 
and he has a machine health care administration university of fundamental studies in russia and uh, dr velagedar is joining us online chairman of session distinguished experts panelists ladies and gentlemen in thank you for the opportunity i extend my deepest gratitude to the nutrition society of sri lanka for inviting me for the annual scientific sessions 2021 for a speech on this timely important theme stimulants addictions and behavioral change in nutrition substance abuse and nutrition on consideration of nutrition perspectives substance abuse lead to lifestyle changes which include irregular eating and poor diet proper nutrition is a vital part of the healing process in addiction recovery in order to improve and maintain healthy organs and to cope infections therefore it is highlighted that implementing proper nutrition guideline will help drug dependent persons recovering from addiction heal faster and more effectively in the detoxification period and to recover from damages caused to the system and the body organ people suffering from addiction typically experience constipation and withdrawal symptoms such as diarrhea nausea vomiting which eliminates its nutrition and result in nutritional deficiencies and imbalance of electrolytes accordingly substance abuse is one of the leading cause of nutritional deficiency it has been reported that people suffering from substance abuse typically suffer from vitamin b6 thiamine and folic acid deficiencies stimulant types of drugs such as cocaine amphetamine methamphetamine and ketamine reduce appetite and can cause severe weight loss and poor nutrition the stimulant addictions also cause dehydration and loss of key electrolytes on the other hand proper nutrition is a responsible for producing and maintaining serotonin levels and other neuro neurotransmitters providing a barrier against toxins limiting inflammation helping to absorb nutrition from food and body functions and affect mood and determine how individual feel and respond to nutrition considering all above it is essential that properly balanced nutrition to improve individuals emotion health and physical health elevate mood and prevent depression how can nutrition affect addiction recovery it is vitally important to incorporate a healthy diet within an addiction recovery program to promote long lasting healing however it may be difficult from a person suffering from addiction to stop taking drugs and adopt to strict diet therefore it is essential that eliminating of drug use while only implementing simple step by step dietary changes to regular meal times on consideration of the relapsing nature of the drug addiction it is more likely that the drug use individuals to relapse when the person has poor eating habits therefore introducing regular meals with proper diet is very important drinking plenty of water is also an important part of nutrition in addiction recovery on consideration of the process of elimination of where dehydration is common during the recovery process considering all about it is important for the person in drug recovery to eat healthy nutritious meals and to avoid nutritionally void food like sweets and processed foods importance of nutrition for drug addiction recovery drug addiction recovery is a long healing process which include many components one of the first stage of addiction recovery is detoxification which in all removal of drug out of the person system and allow them to go through withdrawal side effects while under medical supervision the next step involves rehabilitation with a number of therapies such as cognitive behavior therapy soft skill development sports therapy life skill development motivational therapy or therapy someone in addiction recovery may see a nutrition nutrition is for help with improving nutrition and health through custom dietary regimes and healthy supplements nutrition and nutrition counseling a vital part of the developing good overall health and helping the body to recover from the effects of addiction 
when nutrition is combined with behavioral therapies and individual group and peer support those suffering from addiction have the best chance at recovering and maintaining abstinence from drug abuse role of public sector agencies related to nutrition and diet dietics within the programs of drug prevention and control nutritionists and dietitian play crucial role in supporting nutrition intervention in treatment and rehabilitation program therefore it is highly essential to establish mechanism to coordinate with professionals in the field of nutrition and dietics in order to identify nutrition deficiencies and implement appropriate interventions through nutrition assessment including nutrition focus physical exam prescription of therapeutic diet as a appropriate and education of the drug use individuals on the purpose of diet how to follow it and address any barriers that may prevent him or her from following it are essential components in the treatment and rehabilitation program dietitian can also assist in creating healthy manners that reduce cost and food waste provide in the residential treatment program for the facility and implement data driven quality assurance performs improvement programs to ensure quality food and nutrition related service are provided to the patient moreover use of dietary supplements among the general population has gained popularity in recent years which may be due to various facts such as over the counter availability of dietary supplements and perceptions that dietary supplements are safe to use although some dietary supplements may have acceptable safety profiles many are associated with adverse events and have proven presence of narcotic drugs psychotropic substances other newly emerging drugs including prohibited substance in sports despite the potential harm associated with use the use of dietary supplement among the adolescent population has been reported furthermore the harmful effects of dietary supplements may be enhanced if the agents are abused or misused therefore national dangerous drug control board has proposed to take regulatory measures to supplement ensuring the quality of the products and the absence of harmful narcotic drugs psychotropic substances are the newly emerging drugs including prohibited substances is prior to release into the market the national dangerous drug control board with the principal nutritional institution a national institution for prevention and control drug abuse in sri lanka and as the national focal point has recognized that the drug problem can only be effectively addressed through comprehensive coordinated strategy and multilateral setting where supply control and demand reduction strategies are implemented we have recognized the importance of strong collaboration among all sectors which are crucial to enhance drug prevention and control activities and accelerate in the progress in achieving the ultimate goal of the government to establish country free from drug abuse consider all about professionals in the field of nutrition play a significant role to improve treatment outcome and restoring the nutritional status of drug use individuals prescribing therapeutic diets to manage health conditions brought on by alcohol or drugs and by providing nutrition education and promoting an overall healthy lifestyle in this important occasion i am delighted to invite the nutrition society of sri lanka its members and all participants to take hand with national dangerous drug control board to collaborate toward achieving our ultimate goal a secure country free from drug abuse i thank you again for inviting me to this important event and thank you for your kind attention thank you very much dr velagedara and uh, now it's a time for our panel discussion for a panel discussion uh, two of our uh, speakers are joining online 
and uh, Professor Arjuna De Silva is here, and we have few questions uh, from uh, online viewers. And uh, again, the actually, uh, uh, thank you very much for all three speakers for their lectures. Uh, and uh, first question goes to Professor Arjuna De Silva again, and. Uh, Actually, they finally uh, we discussed that Dr. Velagedra explained the public sector role in the prevention of addiction. Uh, there's one question and uh, uh, asking from Professor Arjuna, and uh, what is actually what is the public sector role in uh, the controlling the supplements? Yeah, I think John. No? I think that's a very relevant question again. So as you said. Uh, Supplements are currently not regulated. Even the US has a problem, FDA doesn't regulate supplements. However, uh, there is a way around this. So uh, the NMRA is now working on uh, getting the supplements, nutraceuticals, nutraceuticals uh, to go through the NMRA. Yes, now currently. And what I suggested is that if anything, most of these are whey protein based products. Others, banned substances, any case, you can easily ban. The problem is uh, if you have uh, all whey protein substances should go through in the market. If that happens, we can regulate this. Uh, quite well because that's most of these products have whey protein uh, in addition to the other substances. So anything any when you say nutraceuticals, they should they contain small amounts of uh, drugs they can have. So those should go through the NMRA for uh, regulation. So we have a, a big place to play in that. And we had one meeting which included customs, all the stakeholders. Uh, customs need to uh, detect uh, the thing. And then MRA, then uh, pharmacologists and the nutrition society. I don't know if the, they all are certain, but they all are definitely a stakeholder. And would like to invite the uh, uh, president to Professor Chandima to have a MOU between SLADA and Nutrition Society so that we also can cooperate in this. Thank you. Right. Thank you, sir. Uh, I think Dr. Harchan is uh, joining online with us. Yes. There's a question uh, for you. Uh, one person is actually he's asking, uh, you have explained uh, behavior changes. Uh, which can practice for the nutritional habits. And uh, he's asking, even though, uh, as you explained, the behavior change is simple or easier, and he's asking in a practical manner, it's very difficult to uh, change the behavior pattern of uh, patients and even the community. And uh, any other explanation to actually make it easier to change the behavior pattern, especially applied for the nutrition? Uh, yes, it's the common belief, and we all we too believe that it's difficult. So then it will be difficult, no? Uh, if so, this message should be given. It is it is not that difficult, but we have to start from a very little change, a small step. So then it's very easy for us to set our mind. That is my message. Because usually we, we help uh, advisors. We give the ideal to the patient. But practically, sometimes it's difficult. So that's why we have to start from a very small thing. Because by doing or achieving a little thing, only we get the positive reward or the positive reinforcement. So I'm just inviting you all to just uh, try this and see reward and, you know, engage the patient, educate the patient or the society or the, your, the, whoever the target group, educate them, engage them, and then uh, empower them, tell that they can, and then I think 
little by little we can break this myth and achieve something fruitful thank you uh, thank you madam another question for you and uh, it's actually the need a lot of explanation and today uh, we can see a lot of young people are addicted to various kind of drugs heroin and uh, in uh, actually the public sector uh, how we can actually uh, educate the people about this addiction special for the heroin kind of things and uh, what is the role of a uh, medical doctor uh, in prevention of addiction for a heroin kind of thing uh, in prevention especially uh, actually i am not an expert on substance abuse but still so this this is also an behavior as prevention what i think is you know the our target group should be young people children and that is to make them assertive how to say no you know people like to experiment things uh, like to test things new and also sometimes they struggle to handle with power or you know uh, more powerful people so from small age what we have to do is to engage them in activities uh, where they have to be assertive and say no to certain things and educate them education is very important uh, even from the young stages about these substances and how to say no uh, and uh, this is i think the only way to prevent other than uh, you know from the uh, other side uh, limiting these substances but whatever it is empowering our young people youth that is our doctor's duty whenever we get a chance clinic or when we talk to the public uh, or when we do certain school programs thank you uh, thank you ma'am i think dr velagedar is online and yeah. uh, there's a simple question for him and uh, anonymous actually a uh, person is asking how to join as a society is to control the drugs uh, intervention in sri lanka whether there is any way of joining the dangerous drug control authority yeah thank you very much for uh, this opportunity actually uh, there are a lot of ways to uh, join with uh, national dangerous drug control board as well as uh, i have initiated a couple of volunteer teams all over the country Uh, when you consider about the drug control, uh, there are uh, two things: so supply reduction and demand reduction. So, uh, uh, as you know, supply reduction is a main concern currently, uh, especially regarding the heroin, uh, methamphetamine, or ice. So, uh, this thing uh, happening through the um, Minister of Defence under three forces and this. And meanwhile, we are doing uh, basically uh, demand reduction. And when you consider about the demand reduction, uh, two aspects again. So, uh, so we are uh, mainly focused on uh, school prevention. So we have already initiated uh, school prevention programs. Uh, uh, it's a skill development, as uh, uh, Dr. Harshani said. Uh, we have to empower the ch uh, child uh, skills. Uh, say no to uh, drugs. so uh, we have uh, empowered the teachers first and we are uh, identifying three teachers from one school and uh, increase it up to 30000 teaching uh, teachers force so if you are a teacher then you can uh, join with this force that's one thing and when you consider about the youths so again uh, we uh, we have a um, uh, coordination with the ministry of youth and sports and again uh, we are doing uh, awareness programs throughout the country with that part so um these are the main two arms and uh, if you are uh, uh, in a religious uh, capacity so then you can join through the ministry of uh, religious affairs so we have an, another uh, joining mechanism to uh, educate the uh, community so uh, somehow you can uh, contact our hotline that is a 1927 the new hotline 1927 so uh, you can if you are a volunteer so you can uh, call to that hotline and join with us and uh, just say that you are willing to combine with us so those are the main uh, uh, ways to join with national dangerous drug control board as well as um, to join with this uh, to create a drug free nation in sri lanka uh, thank you sir and uh, we are 
coming to uh, close this session and the final question and uh, uh, there's a question because of the covid pandemic and is there any change of uh, uh, the doping uh, control activity in sri lanka whether it's continuous same yes i i touched on that uh, it, it uh, up to the second wave it was as normal actually we were we were we had stopped for some time but uh, second wave again we had to take precautions and but we are continuing anti doping activity not as uh, extensively as we did before but we are for instance the lpl we check anti doping was done and currently during england tour england is here so they have been tested as well and even the national athletes were tested we do mainly out of competition now uh, because we know i mean information is a very important part of anti doping uh, and i want to reiterate that anti doping is not catching people so anti doping is the main thing is value based education in schools so that we can change the behavior of the uh, sportsman who in the of the future but uh, unfortunately policing is also part of our duty so we do that as well and we do mainly uh, out of competition now because information during covid time people who wanted to do it was a golden opportunity they have uh, used that quite well i think yes uh, we had a very fruitful discussion uh, regarding the sorry uh, yeah i can give you uh, time for one question is yes. uh, one question from our audience this was professor arjuna so i want to know because uh, you mentioned about the uh, nutraceuticals capsules and vitamins and meat. so normally nmri is responsible for giving this uh, put in this regulation and everything but for powders nutrition the whey protein powders those things earlier they have classification called uh, borderline classification like uh, certain uh, regulations from there at the same time uh, dangerous stuff control board they they tested a uh, lot of products for doping so if we are recommending uh, nutrition supplement supplement means not capsule sir uh, that is powder form so what should be the procedure for that because nowadays in uh, mri in mri is not uh, getting these uh, classification doing this classification for nutrition supplements powders yeah thank you for that clarification yes uh, powder that's what is suggested to have uh, in mri actually go through the borderline substances and have whey protein as a tag so that anything with whey protein has to go through in mri uh, that's a good way of filtering most of these things out but uh, as currently as i said you have to check on informsport.com if it is there on informsport.com that it is uh, okay that is fairly safe but then the second thing is you can take a batch with the batch number you can take one and get it tested that and uh, dangerous stuff for banned substances and then if it's negative there you can use it right that is probably the safest practical method of doing this to really want that's the way to go so then you can show even if the athlete is caught for doping uh, you can at least uh, have a good case the other thing i want to remind all the medical personnel is that if you intentionally uh, now law if you intentionally prescribe the banned substance to a athlete it's the fine is 1 million rupees or two year jail term according to our law so it's quite a serious thing intentionally unintentionally of course it can happen thank you for that yes thank you uh, sir now uh, we are going to uh, wind up the the first symposium we had a very fruitful discussion related to the stimulants use addictions and doping in sports and the, especially the behavior change how we can use the behavior change for uh, to control these activities 
so i uh, actually thank you very much for the professor arjun de silva and uh, other two lecturers dr harshini rajapaksa madam thank you very much and dr laknath velagedra thank you sir for your time and uh, we are uh, closing the first symposium now and thank you very much for listening uh, physically and thank you very much for the uh, people who are connected in online so thank you and meantime there's a message uh, we are going to give a, a question for the listeners in online and uh, we are giving the prizes uh, them uh, if, when they send the proper answer quickly through our chat and uh, the first question for the first symposium and uh, the question is what do wada stand for it's very simple question you can send the answers especially we are inviting the uh, students who are joining it undergraduates please send your answer with your uh, mobile number the nutrition society is uh, giving you the prizes for this one thank you